from their parents and their elders in our church, Lord, to love them. And God, that we would just uh, uphold them. And Lord, I think of other grandchildren that are represented that aren't here today, but maybe they're in another city or another town, even another state, Lord. And I pray for those grandchildren and children that are out other places that you would protect them, too, on behalf of the people of God here in Holbury. So it's a sweet time where we can just pray and uh, take this time to bless, to cover, Lord, our students in prayer. And we ask this in Christ's holy name and God's people said, Amen. 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 I want the church to know that uh, we support this group, don't we? Okay, that didn't sound too convincing. We, we support this group, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. The adults in our church love you guys and are behind you. And I know that. I know they, they tell me that on the behind the scenes. So it's important to know that. Amen? All right, God bless you guys. And you can go back to your seats at this point. Thank you for uh, the young people. I made it a vow when I first went into ministry that I would I would fight for young youth and children's work as long as I had breath. And I made that a commitment ever since I was a kid or a young kid. I you know it's 21, 22, 30 years older now, but um, it's important. Uh, it's, it's the next generation coming up. You know we got we got to do that. We got to reach. So my heart goes out to them and also to uh, any of you that have you know, children, grandchildren that you're raising up and praying for and love them. Uh, don't ever, ever give up. <laughs> don't ever give up. But sometimes it's that praying grandmother, great praying grandfather that, that it, God uses that. Don't ever think that you won't use that. So it's really important. Okay, if you'll open your Bibles. Um, I put I put the Bibles back out. This this bothered me when we reopened, and uh, talked to Kevin about this in the morning too. But you can put it all on me. But it really bothered me we didn't have the Bibles back in the pews. So the Bibles are out on the table, and this is where we're going to do it. If you, you didn't bring your Bible, you want to have a Bible while service is going on, just to take the Bible, use it, keep it in the pews, and our uh, ushers custodians and things. We'll clean those up later, and then we'll have it ready for the next week. So is that clear? So I think it's crazy not to have the Bible in the church. Amen. I think that's nuts. But anyway, that's just my own opinion. It's like I said earlier in the worship meeting, it's like not having, uh, you know, the, the fire department not having a fire hose, you know? <laughs> you know, what? It, it's pretty important that we have the Bible uh, right away and available. You can bring your own Bibles as well, but if you'll turn in your Bibles to uh, Proverbs, uh, chapter 3, and Proverbs just has a lot of, of wisdom in it. This is a wisdom series that I've been teaching and, and, and preaching on. And so if you haven't been here for the first three messages, this is the fourth of a five-part series. We'll finish this up next week. Next week I'll preach in, in Jeremiah and the Ball of Gilead. That's an old-fashioned term, but I wanted to uh, end with that. Last two weeks we've talked on James. And what um, James said about the wisdom and that the source of wisdom, it either comes from the earth, <laughs> earthly mankind, human thinking, or sensual sexuality type of wisdom, or demonic wisdom, or it comes from heaven and from God above. And so there's different characteristics of that. Today, we're going to look at uh, godly wisdom in troubling times in Proverbs chapter 3. I'm going to read the first uh, eight verses. And we're going to look at the whole chapter of Proverbs 3, but it's also, it's about God's wisdom, following God's wisdom. And I want you to know that God wants you to know his wisdom because when you know his wisdom and his commands and his precepts and his word, that's where you will find peace in Jesus. And the world says you'll find it by getting stuff. You'll have, you know, this and that and everything else. And that's what's going to give you peace. It doesn't. Finding God's truth and following his truth, that's what sustains you and gives you uh, peace and a, and a confidence in life that you can't get anywhere else. 
So I want to make that clear. So in Proverbs 3, picking up in verse 1, the Bible says this, and he's addressing his son. He says, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Do not let uh, mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. These next two verses are great. These changed my life when I was a young person. My mom gave me these two verses when I graduated from high school. And I've gone back to them over and over and over and over. Many of you know what they are and had them memorized. But if you don't know it, put it in your memory bank because it will come back at the right time. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your way, everything you do, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path straight. Those are great wisdom verses. Trust in the Lord with some of your heart, no, all of your heart. <laughs> acknowledge him in everything you're doing. He's going to direct your path in life straight. Then in verses 7 and 8, he says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. This is what the world does. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. I find it amazing how people live in opposition to God. In other words, not obedient to God, but they live in opposition to God, but yet they wonder why they're not experiencing peace in their life. I want you to think about that. Because a lot of people, they live in total opposition to God or somewhat opposition to God and His Son Jesus, but then they're not experiencing the peace that God would have them have in their life. And that's what God wants to give you is His peace through his wisdom, through the relationship of Jesus. God's word, it has precepts, it has instruction, and it has commands to ensure wisdom throughout our whole life. Now I want you to think about this. Any of you have children? Some of you are claiming them right now. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, if you have a child and they're doing something stupid, what do you do? You correct them. Why? Is it just to be mean? No, it's because you want to see that child end up 20, 40 years from now not being an imbecile and ending up on TV in their own life. Right? Right. So God wants us. So we, we want to impart wisdom into our children, right? So they make good choices, so they're rejecting what's not right and, and embrace what is good. That's the greatest call of every parent. Is to get that wisdom of God in them. Train up the Lord the way should, they should go. When they're old, they will not depart from it. Proverbs says that too. So God, in his sovereignty, he knows. He knows everything. He created everything. He's always been and always will be. And so he knows what's best for us. Our, our lifetime is a short lifetime compared to all history and all eternity. And so he wants to impart wisdom into us. Why? So we will go down the correct path in life. So we will have peace. Not just to be right with God only, which is great, that's what we need to be, but that we will understand and be able to live this great life that he would rather have for us instead of living opposite of him and living in frustration, fear, and not having peace. And so God's word it has these precepts, these commands, these laws. If you drive down Mulberry Street going 62 miles an hour, there's a law that says it's supposed to be 25. And if you go faster than that, it's a law, it's a precept, meaning you're breaking the law and you're going to pay the penalty for that. In life, if we do our own thing without God and without God's laws and understanding, then we pay for that, unfortunately, because we've chosen to just reject what is right. And so God has wisdom for us, and he wants us to understand it is for our best. That's what's so important about it. Now the world's gonna say, ah, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't not do this. And oh, come on, live it up, party it up, do this, everything else, and, and it's okay. But when God says it's not okay, 
it's put there for a protection for us. So wisdom, like I said last week, there's a lot of worldly knowledge, but wisdom is, is way different than knowledge. Wisdom is how you live your life before God. And so these commandments that we have, these precepts, this instruction that God gives through his word to wisdom is really important for us to listen to unless you want to be ignorant. Like, I don't think we want to be ignorant. I, I don't want to be ignorant of, of what God would have the best for me. And so if we obey God's instructions, then we gain godly wisdom. But if we deny and reject God's wisdom, then we repel and we push back and his blessing, his favor, and his peace in our life. So you can see there, there's two different roads. Jesus says there's two roads you can follow. The straight and narrow road, which is his kingdom, and it leads to eternal life. It's a difficult one. Or there's this wide road that most people are on, but it leads to destruction. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14. So wisdom, do we really want it? Why have it? What's the point of it? Is it just a bunch of laws and regulations? No. It's for our best. God has the best in store for you. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, I'm going to give you some examples that are up on the screen. And these, these examples all happen on the same day. I got it out of a newspaper not that long ago. And so this is what happened. Now, anybody like Ferraris? I've never been in one. Okay, this is a $260,000 car. A guy in London, England, he bought the car. And in one hour, he totaled the car. It went up in flames. It got, it got going so fast, you know, like the air under it, and he flipped it and he sent it into a, a whirlwind and a wreck. And he wrecked the car within one hour, and it went up in flames. Now, I don't know if it's real wise, even if you have that kind of money to spend $260,000 on one car. I think that's a little frivolous. But anyway, uh, I know I won't be in that category. I don't even know how you pay the insurance on that, let alone the taxes. But, um, Having a Ferrari for one hour and then totaling it probably wasn't a great choice. Now, there's another uh, picture we've got up here. There's an uh, axe. Uh, in Pennsylvania, there was a, a, a wife, her name was Mrs. Snyder, and she came after her husband and came after him with an axe and started chopping him. And they had this violent thing go on in their house, and the kids were in the house, and the, the oldest daughter, 17 year old, calls the, the police. And, they found her on a country road, and, and all this blood was on her shirt. And, and what, what did it say on the shirt? Nope, not today. <laughs> a little bit of a chip on her shoulder, obviously. Nope, not today. She went after her husband with the axe. I don't know what was going on in their marriage. Obviously not good things. But probably not a wise choice in how to handle it. Okay, another picture up on the screen here. Uh, there were some angry ladies in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, came at the Chick-fil-A right at the end of the shift, and the doors were locked. You ever go to a restaurant, and the doors have just been locked, and you go, ah, oh, man, I'm hungry, I want to eat. Well, these ladies took it to a little bit different level, and they started beating on the door, and they broke into the place, and they started ransacking the place, and they wouldn't serve them, and they caused over $1,000 of damage at the Chick-fil-A in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Not, probably not a very wise choice. Not a very peaceful choice. Not, not the way to handle it. You probably go through another drive through or, Lord forbid, go to the grocery store and cook your own food. But anyway. Uh, now, there's another sad story. This happened also in Florida. There was a 29-year-old couple. I guess they were homeless. And uh, they decided to make a suicide pact. And just before the train was coming down the track, they laid in front of the train. And the train hit them. Miraculously, they survived. Uh, the, the engineer was trying to slow the train down, but he couldn't get it. You know, the train, when it's going, to slow it down. He saw it at you know, the last moment. And uh, they weren't making too good of a choice there. So there's a lot of things that people do with, without much wisdom attached to them. Now, as we move into this message uh, this morning, verses 1, 2, and 3, we see godly wisdom's call. It's a call. It's a call to go to God for wisdom. So I want to read these verses again. Proverbs 3.1. My son, do not forget my law, 
but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Anybody want long days and good life? Or do you want a short life or a really short life? I, I'd rather have the long days and, good, and a good life. Okay, and then verse 3, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so he's saying here to keep wisdom's instruction written on your heart. In other words, what God deposits into your life, keep them in your heart and learn from God, learn from his word, learn from his precepts and his instruction and keep them in, in your heart. In uh, Psalm 119, Verse 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That very famous verse that many people live by and try to. Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your word is a light unto my darkened path where I don't know where, where I'm going. So God's word gives us that. Jeremiah 31, 33 tells us this as well. But I want to read a section of scripture over in um, Deuteronomy. This is a wisdom section. And this the context of this is that Moses is trying to get the Israelites to remember what God had taught the people of God in Egypt. And when they go into the promised land, not to forget his commands and, and their faith and their God. And he's trying to teach them this. And so he, say, he says this in Deuteronomy 6 1. Now, this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and the judgment which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, Moses is saying, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God, keep all the statutes, all his commandments, which I command to you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged, here we go again, a longer life. Therefore I hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, that it may multiply greatly as the Lord your God and your fathers have promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Then he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be on the front that's between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. When he says them to teach them diligently to your children, when you're on the, on the road walking, when you're driving in the car with the radio on in today's modern world, when you're, when you're off at a restaurant somewhere or wherever, teach these things to your children in everyday life. And the word is impress, and it means, it's a Hebrew word to inculcate, or it means indention with and by biting with your teeth. Anybody ever have a, a person bite your arm, maybe your brother or sister when you're little kids, and they bit your arm, and you have the teeth marks after 10 minutes, they're still there? That's really what it means to impress into your children, to bite into them God's principles. In other words, to make an indention or an impression into their life so they know what it is. It doesn't literally mean bite it, but that's the whole meaning of the word to inculcate or to impress upon your children God's truth so they will live a long and godly and prosperous life that God would have for them because that's God's best. And so we see here in this the godly wisdom call. And he says to fasten them around your neck in verse three. Let not mercy and truth forsake you Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. How many people here today have a necklace on? Okay, lots of jewelry. Why, why do you do that? Kind of goes with the outfit a little better. I personally can't hardly, I can't stand to have any jewelry. So I, I, if I had a necklace on, I'd be going, Ooh. I, I play with my ring. I can hardly wear a wedding band. I can put it on Stuff hanging off me. But why do you wear a necklace? It's to adorn you. It's to match you. You think about that. Wear wisdom. Fasten wisdom around your neck. In other words, remember it over your soul, over your body, over your heart, and above you, above your, where you make your logical decisions and your 
life. So he's saying this. Now we see Godly's relation, uh, Godly wisdom's relationship with God. So gaining Godly wisdom, what are we to do? This is, this is why we're here at church, right? To gain Godly wisdom. Amen? Worship the Lord. Get grounded in our faith. Be equipped to live for God throughout the week. So what should we do to gain this wisdom? Well, he says here, and you, like I quoted earlier, verses 5 through 8, you know, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path straight. And so God wants us to trust in him, and that he will, he will help us, and that God wants to, us to seek him, and he will guide us. And so if you're not seeking God and trying to seek God's wisdom, it's hard for him to guide you because your heart isn't really wanting that wisdom. But the opposite is also true. If you're seeking God, God, I want, I want to go, I want to understand how to follow you. I want to understand what pleases you and gives me, will give me peace in my life. That means you're seeking after God's wisdom, so it's important. And so, in verses 7 and 8, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. You know, we have thousands, millions of people that are trying to be wise in their own eyes. The world teaches them, you know, you know, there's no God, it's, you know, everything's by chance, it's, you know, we live, we die, everything's done afterwards, and, you know, just do whatever you want. Humanism, be wise in your own eyes. Who's on the throne? Human beings, not God. He's saying, don't do that. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. If people would just simply, and then we learned this already, that that the beginning of, of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. If you're going to have God's wisdom, you have to have a holy understanding and a fear that God is perfect. And, we, and that means to reverence Him and put Him first in your life. Then he says, tithe to the Lord. What does that mean? He's saying here, if you're going to gain godly wisdom, trust Him, put Him first, don't depend on your own wisdom, don't follow the things of the world, you're going to live a long and good life, you'll have God's favor, you have God's peace as you're walking through even difficult circumstances because you're seeking him. But then he says, tithe to the Lord. That means to honor God with your first earnings. He even says for your first possessions. How many people value their possessions? The question isn't having possessions, but do your possessions possess you? The question isn't really money, it's that money is more important than anything else. So God says in his word, and this is crazy, it makes no sense to the non-Christian. He's saying, give me your first fruits, your first earnings, that tenth, that first ten percent. Give me that and see, he says this in Malachi 3, 10 through 12, test me now in this. See if I will not provide for you. Many of you you are strong Christians, and you understand this principle, because you, you, you've seen God provide over and over and over. Anybody ever have a check that came out of nowhere to pay a bill? I've had stuff like this happen. I can't explain it. All I can know is if I honor God, I trust Him with my finances. It's really a matter of faith. Lord, am I going to trust in my own ingenuity, or am I going to put you first, because you're the one that gave me the abilities to have the job in the first place. I want your blessing over my family. I want to support my local congregation. I want to follow God. I want to, I, I want to see you do things that I can't even imagine. And that's, that's, that's a test of lordship. It's just one of many, many things. He's saying, trust in the Lord, tie them to the Lord. And so, in verses 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your possessions. Do you honor God with what you possess? Or is it just for self? You, you can use things for God's kingdom. I appreciate Kevin and Barb. They, they take the youth out on the, on the boat. If their pontoon boat isn't just for them. They, they, they come on out and we'll cook hamburgers for you guys and young people. Young people, do you, do you appreciate when they go, we go out on the boat and do the tubing? Oh, that's fun. Especially when you see David Walker or somebody flipping over and that's very hard. So, so honor the Lord with your possessions. That, that's what it means to use what you have for God's work and God's kingdom. It's not yours. You can't take it with you anyway after you die, right? 
So use it for God's current kingdom now. So he's saying, honor the Lord with what you have, your possessions, and then the first fruits of all of your increase. This is the what, the results. So your barns, if your bank account, I don't know how it means in today's world, but some of your farmers, you get this, will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. So this is, this is a promise from God's word. Now, denying God's wisdom, what not to do? <laughs> we need to know this too. What we shouldn't be doing if we're going to gain godly wisdom. This, this is a great chapter in the Bible. We need to not despise this wisdom from God. Verses 11 and 12, he says, My son, do not despise the chasing or the discipline of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son, in whom he delights. Do you love disciplining your children? If you do, there's probably something wrong with you. But anyway, um, if you love disciplining your children, it's, it's you love your children, but you do so because you care about where they will end up. Hebrews 12, 5, and 6 quotes the same verses there in verses 11 and 12. And so we're not to despise when God corrects us. So if God is correcting us of, of a hardened or bitter attitude, or God's correcting us that we're wrong and doing something maybe in our relationships or in our family, or maybe we're, we're doing something unethical or whatever with our bodies, whatever we're, we're doing, if God's showing us, you know, that's just not what, what I have in store for you, that's God spanking us. <laughs> but it's because he loves us. So the Bible says there, you know, Denying God's wisdom, what not to do, don't despise the Lord's discipline. Then he says, do not lose sight. Do not lose sight of godly discernment. Now in verse uh, 21, we see this in, in the Bible, in chapter 3 there, Proverbs. My son, let, not, excuse me, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Or it can also be translated discernment. So, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom in discretion and discernment. And so we need to not lose sight of godly discernment. Godly discernment is such a gift that we need. And if maybe you have a hard time discerning in God's plan in your life, or maybe a decision that you need to make, get around godly people that you trust. You can ask me to. I don't know everything, but I'll... I do feel I have that gift of discerning, helping people make right choices and saying, you know what, this relationship you're in, this is not going in a good direction. You know, you're being abused here. This isn't probably God's plan for you. <laughs> I mean, discernment is huge. It can really help you get an outside objective to um, truth that God wants you to see. And so we say here, don't lose sight of godly discernment. And it's being able to see the course of action you're going down or the source of, of the teaching or the proposal uh, for something happening in your life. You know, it may sound good, but it may not be from God. And so things can, you know, people can get swayed by, hey, it's a bigger salary or it's this or that. And then they make the jump and then they realize they're into something that, oh, wow, I didn't really discern through this process. So discernment is huge. It's, it's huge. We are not to lose sight of that discernment. Then he says here in verses 25 and 26, don't be overtaken by fear. Now, let me ask the question. Is there a lot of people operating in fear right now? He's saying, if you're going to be wise and in my peace and in my presence and following my commands, do not be overcome by fear. Fear is from the enemy. Fear is from Satan. Satan imposes fear into people so they shut down and they can't function right. That comes from not from our Lord. That comes from the one that wants to destroy your life. Fear is a crippling thing. When people use fear to manipulate others, they're, they're just like the devil themselves. And so God does not want us to be overcome and overtaken by fear. Because God is our security. It says this in verses 25 and 26. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence. God's going to be your confidence. It means your security. And he will keep your foot 
from being caught. The Bible says, from where does my help come from? Psalm 121, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Then it says, he will not let your foot slip. He will neither let you slumber or Israel slumber uh, in your sleep by night. That's a beautiful section of scripture in Psalm 121. But God does not want us to be overtaken by fear. It also says there, do, do, do you not wrong your neighbor. Don't plot evil against trustworthy people. Shouldn't plot it against anybody, but especially people that you live close to. Anybody have a neighbor? If you have a good neighbor that you count on, like, like, like when you go away, you can give them your key to let your dog out or check on the house. Anybody have those kind of neighbors? It's great when you have them. And so he's saying here something about being neighborly and do not wrong your neighbor. Verses 27 through 30, do not withhold good from those whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not devise evil against your neighbor, for he dwells by you for safety's sake. Do not strive with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. Our former parsonage, that means where the pastor lives, in our former congregation, we had uh, some great neighbors. We lived out in the country, and all of our dogs ran loose. And it was actually a great thing, because they were all calm. They would only go one yard away. It's funny how dogs will do their business in somebody else's yard, and then their, our dog will do our business in their yard, where we just kind of, you know, <laughs> sorry. That's just the way it worked. But what happened with the dogs, with the dogs, some of you dog lovers will love this, was that all the dogs ran loose in our little country, little five, six complex neighborhood. We all had fairly good sized yards. But if somebody else came up to one of the driveways, all of a sudden five dogs were around that car. And sometimes that proved very protective and a good thing. <laughs> a very good thing. And I can remember one night, my, my friend Bob, who, who lived next to me, and his wife Jamie, they, they watched out for our kids sometimes. They had, they had to be gone. They would watch our house, make sure there wasn't any you know, weird people coming up or anything like that. We had to be gone. We couldn't be there with them. I got a church meeting or whatever. And one time, there was this time, there was this white Mustang that came up. And I just happened to get up. And we, had our up we had our windows open in our bedroom. It was in the summertime. There was this white Mustang, and two guys got out. It was 3.30 in the morning. I knew something was up, so I grabbed my dog and my leash and walked out there and I just said, you know, and they knocked on the door and Bob was there, but I was like, you know, is there something going on? You know, can we help you? But he knew that I had his back with my dog Scout, and my dog Scout would have torn him up. Because <laughs> you don't come up, come up to somebody's house at 3.30 in the morning. So, safety. Why? cause harm on your neighbor when they help keep you safe is what he's saying there. Why plot evil against those around you? Why not plot seeds of peace and wisdom so they will trust you? That's a witness as well. Then we see here uh, um, another thing about not what not to do is do not envy a violent man. Don't envy people that are violent. We talked about this in the first message in this series, in Psalm 37, 1 and 7. Do not fret over evildoers when they succeed, when they do things that are wrong, and it seems like they get away with it. Here in these verses, in 30, verses 31 through 35, the last verses of this scripture, do not envy the oppressor, or choose none of his ways, and choose none of his ways. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. That's a great verse. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. You know the word abomination? The, the Hebrew means it means it makes God vomit. And it's interesting that abomination usually is used with sexual perversion in the Bible. So he's saying there, for the perverse person, for the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. God will give secret wisdom and counsel to those who are seeking him. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. 
Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. Now we're going to look at some godly wisdom rewards. These are some things that we need to understand, that God has good things for us if we're wanting his wisdom in our life. First of all, anybody want a long and satisfying life? Or do you want to buy me out this afternoon or something? I think you want a long and satisfying life. That's a good thing. That's a thing we should strive for. And so godly wisdom will give us a long and satisfying life. In verses 2 and 16 and 17, he says this, For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Verse 16, Length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths our peace. Also, another wisdom reward that we will have from God is that we will have favor with both God and man. You'll gain a good reputation around people. This is another reward from God. In verse 4, the Bible says, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Luke 2.52, the Bible says, when Jesus was younger, he grew wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And God wants to give that to you. It's a great reward that you'll grow and have that good reputation. Also, wisdom, this is very important, wisdom is more precious than material wealth. Wisdom is more precious than material wealth. Well, the way a lot of people live, you would think the material wealth is more precious than wisdom. <laughs> but the Bible says here, in, in verses 13 and 15, it says, Happy is the man who finds wisdom, and the man that gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire. Also, the tree of life we see in verse 18. In Genesis 2 9, this is a really interesting study in and of itself, is in the book of Genesis. Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, Satan the tempter, and you have two trees, the tree of life, which is eternal life, those who eat of God's wisdom, those who know God and follow God and his truth, they will not experience the second death, which means your soul living separated from God in eternity, forever in judgment, but actually in God's kingdom in heaven. The tree of life, but there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's the one that Satan tempted Adam and Eve. Hey, did God really say that? You know, no, that's not what he meant by that. He says, as soon as you eat of that tree, light bulb's going to go on. You're going to be able to be just like God. And isn't that today's world? Eh, I'm going to be self-sufficient. I'm going to, you know, it's the same temptation in this modern day. I don't need God. And so the tree of life, as it says here in verse 18, she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. And in Revelation, you have it in Genesis, the tree of life, and in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation, chapters 21, 20 and 21 and 22. And those who have the tree of life will not experience the second death. To know Jesus Christ, to have his wisdom in their life, it prevents you from eternity separated from God. So that's another reason that God's wisdom rewards. Also, a confidence and security. Anybody need confidence and security? You'll find it in God's wisdom. He says this in verse 22. So they will live life to your soul and grace. So they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down in your sleep, it will be sweet. We see this. Now, godly wisdom, to wrap up this message this morning, it produces an understanding that God has the very best for your life. He's got the very best plan for your life. That's why we need his wisdom. And we must search for it and seek after it and listen to him. Also, that godly favor, this is important, godly favor hinges on obedience to his truth and to his wisdom. So godly favor, if you're going to have God's favor and peace and covering in your life, it hinges on obeying this truth from God. 
So you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I'm going to live opposite of God and yet have this great favor in your life from God. And so that's, that's really important to understand. So godly wisdom, it produces this understanding in us. And lastly, godly wisdom, it produces an understanding that spiritual stability, it comes by trusting God's truth. Spiritual stability comes by trusting God's truth. I have two verses up on the screen. And we're going to read the first one together. We're going to read it together in unison and it's all at the same time. So let's read Proverbs 14 too. He whose walk is upright fears the Lord, but he whose ways are devious despises him. That's a really good verse. A person who's living their life before God, doing the thing God wants them to do, and living it in fear of God and righteous and righteousness. Is, is where the Lord wants them. But the person whose ways are devious, they're crooked, they're slick, they're sly, they're perverted, they're this, that, and everything else, they actually despise the Lord. The last verse, and I quote this one a lot, Proverbs 14, 12, I'll give you this one a little more. Let's say it together. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. That's a great verse for our day and age we live in. There's a way that seems logically right, humanistic right, but in the end, spiritually, it leads to destruction. Let's pray. Lord, you love us. You have good things planned for our lives. God, you want the best for us. And you give us the best in your word through your son Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. God, I pray this message will uh, prompt us to study more and to desire your wisdom, and to seek your wisdom before we make big decisions, especially, and small ones too. God, you have good things in store for us. Lord, help us to understand you want us. you got a great plan for us, but there's also a proper way to live our life before you and before others, so we can have internal peace that only comes by obeying your truth and submitting to you. Lord, there might be somebody here this morning who says, Pastor, I made some really dumb, unwise decisions in my life, and they're still with me. And I don't know how to get over them. I don't know how to not dwell on them anymore. And this might have happened 20 years ago, or 40 years ago, or last week, who knows. But if you're wanting God's peace, I challenge you to just lay that before him and say, Jesus, take this from me. Take this. I trust that you have forgiven me and help me to live a wise and fruitful life for you. I pray that for your people, Lord. There might be somebody carrying something that's in their past and you want to deliver them from this so they can live in your present reality of peace. I ask this in Christ's name. Our altar is open, but there's something that you need to lay before God. He's, he's here. If it's something, anybody done something like a long time ago, man, you're just like, I, I was stupid. <laughs> I, I knew what I was doing. Maybe you didn't know what you were doing, but God wants to forgive that. Amen? Amen. Don't carry it. <laughs> Don't carry it, man. The enemy wants you to hang on to that and be pounded by that thought and that mistake for the rest of your life, because he wants to destroy you. God wants to free you. Amen? I said this in the first service. God wants to take that stuff from the past and say, I'm done with it. I, I, I give it to you, Jesus. Help me from this day forward to live a life of wisdom. And God will do that if you bring it to him. So if there's anybody here this morning, God's dealing with you and say, man, you know, I've done some things that I'm shameful of. I know it's wrong. No, I, I don't know how I don't know how to get it right. <laughs> you might have to go back to a person and ask forgiveness. First of all, you need to ask God to release you from it and forgive you. So as we sing this last song as we close the service this morning, God's touching you to, to release something so you can have his wisdom and his forgiveness. I just challenge you to do that today. I'm standing with this to worship.
as we close this service off, we go back more to the reality of real life. God, I pray we will take your wisdom with us and seek it more precious than silver or fine rubies or gold. God, help us to apply it. And Lord, help us to correct, uh, take your correction in our lives. Lord, you love us and you want us to end up in the right place, which is a peaceful, awesome relationship with your abundance in our life. And Lord, we know so many people are not experiencing that. And God, I pray for your people today, Lord. God, that we will just seek you. Lord, our country needs you, Lord. Our families need you, God. Our communities, our churches. And Lord, we're just beggars sitting at your feet, hungry and wanting Lord, the meal that you would have for us. God, thank you for your people. Send us with your peace. Bless them. Go before them. And especially people that are facing difficult circumstances, God. May their wisdom level and understanding of you meet the, the situation that they're going to face. I ask this in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in his peace, go in his grace. God bless you and have a great weekend.